After last season when we caught three birds when we wanted 10, um, we decided this season we'd do things slightly differently. We'd endeavour to catch the birds earlier in November, whereas last time we did it in March, because we'd noticed that they were actually more predictable, reliable, consistent, early, early after they arrived. And the very first time we went out, that worked brilliantly. Um, we put out two nets, and to my disbelief really, um, within about half an hour, 20, 25 birds had walked into the catching area. Yeah. Okay, three, two, one, fire. I don't know how many we got, if we got any. Just don't. Well, there's another one up there. What are you in it? No, it's, no. Yeah, no, I didn't fire. Um, but of course, as we know, with PGP, nothing ever goes smoothly. And what happened this time was that one of the cannon didn't fire properly. So we actually caught three. And well, that's still good, because when you think we got three the whole of last season, but we could have finished the whole project, used up all the tags in the one go, and then been able to take it easy. Anyway, that was three. Um, we decided to name them after their band colours. So we had uh, Kikorangi for blue, Ferro for red and Taya for white. Then uh, things pretty much returned to normal with the PGPs. Um, we must have had a dozen attempts to try and catch birds and got absolutely nothing. So that was it. We caught three the same as last season and we thought we probably put the remaining tags on red knots and, and that would be the end of the project. But Tony Harbracken, who had taken over as lead bander because Adrian was overseas, he decided we should, pretty much the last minute, we should have one more go. There was one more evening when the tides and, and the moon phases and that sort of thing were right. Um, so we had some difficulty getting enough people together, but we did get six. So we put up two nets and sat there all night. <laughs> it was bloody cold <laughs> and caught nothing. Um, then just as dawn was starting to break and of course once it gets too light you can't go mist netting because the birds can see the, the nets. Um, Keith and Gillian went over and checked the net and came back with what they actually thought was a dotterel um, but when we got it out of the bag it turned out it was actually a Pacific Golden Plover. So yay we got at least one more than last season but we called over Tony to work with, do the banding and fit the uh, tags. And while we were doing that, decided to go over and check the net because there was a couple of birds in there that we wanted to free. And on the way over, um, walked past the Sarka cornea and a little flock of birds flew out and flew straight into the net. And two of those turned out to be Pacific Golden Plovers. So we ended up with uh, three for that catch, six for the whole season. The last three caught with about literally 30 seconds to go in our catching time. Then we got to March the 15th, not long, which is our sort of farewell to the birds day. And not long after that, we knew the birds would be leaving. Um, I was just about to head down to the Shorebird Centre um, to um, listen to the guest speaker, someone who incidentally I'd organised, um, when I got a text from Jojo Doyle, one of the key members of the plover team, who she comes from Vermont and, and was actually due to go back home to the US that evening. And she decided to have one last look at the birds. And she sent me a text saying, um, Jojo, the bird is on the stilt ponds. I'm not lying. Uh, so I didn't think she was lying. I, I, instead of having a leisurely drive down to the center to listen to the speaker, I grabbed my gear and rushed down to the stilt ponds and sprinted out to the out to where out to the where the ponds were. Tony Harbraken was already there. Um, we call him the bird whisperer because he can do things with birds that um, other people can't. So I actually we tiptoed down to the end of the stilt ponds and I walked behind him as we very slowly walked up as close as we could to the water's edge and, and quite close to where the birds were and got some photos and video which showed that yes it was Jojo. The first of the birds to leave was almost certainly Ra who probably left on April the 4th 
The last one to leave was probably Ferro, who left on April the 15th. We then waited for the first broadcasts and nothing came. Uh, a few days after he left, there was a ping, a satellite ping um, from Ra, which indicated that he had arrived in Honshu Island, Japan, but it wasn't confirmed by GPS signals or positions, so we weren't able to really take that seriously. We then heard nothing more for the birds, from the birds, for a couple of months. And I must admit, had begun to think that something had really gone wrong with the birds or all the tags. Then suddenly, on the 8th of June, we got six locations from Ra. Three of them were in um, Honshu, different places. Uh, one was on the Aleutian Islands, which um, run down from Alaska, and one was up on the Seawood Peninsula, which is in, in what would be a suitable breeding, breeding ground. And I must say, my, my response was I just sent a, an email out back to Lee and out to the key members of the team saying, wahoo. <laughs> and Amanda replied saying, yippee, <laughs> which is how we felt because we'd actually thought that all the work had probably gone for nothing. Well, as I said, we wait to see if any of the other tags broadcast and we might, they might, we might learn more. We wait to see if Ra's tag or any of the others come back to New Zealand because Jojo painted a very interesting picture of island hopping with lengthy overstays along the way, which isn't what had been expected at all. Um, so it'd be nice to find out more if that is actually the normal pattern that birds coming down here to the far end of the range follow or whether Jojo was, was an outlier.